where's Enrique at? Where's uh, Jason at? Come on upstairs so we can get a good video of it. Do we have a, are we, are we doing video tonight? Okay. Yeah, let's, let's, I want to have it video so we can take it back to his, his church if it's significant. To that church situation. Now we believe in the prophetic. Now this week we haven't done a lot of whole, whole lot of personal prophetic because we've been trying to shape the church for that which is coming. And uh, there are some great things coming. I really want to encourage you. This is not a time to step back. It's a time to go forward because God's about to send supernatural mission in this place, okay? Mm. All right, so on uh, Saturday night, uh, Enrique and Asif came uh, for the first time, and uh, Kevin introduced me to him. And the, the second song, um, as I, I'm, I'm praising God, I, I get a vision of you. And I had never met you other than to say hello. And the first thing I saw, every time I think of a mantle, I think of a fireplace with a mantle above it. And I saw you as that fireplace. And, and God uh, said this one word. He said, kingdom. Kingdom. And when Kevin introduced you to me, he said, this is Enrique, Pastor Ricky. And you go, Enrique. <laughs> And first thing I thought of was, was Richard. And I don't know if Enrique is a special name in, in Guatemala where you're from, if it's a, if it's a, a, a royalty name. But the, the word Richard carries with it royalty in the English language. And so as God began to tell me uh, kingdom authority, I saw this picture and it was, it was you standing there like that fireplace. And God began... Uh, to put these mantles on you. And it was this mantle of kingdom authority. And as I saw it, you were, you were struggling to hold it. You were struggling to, to keep, it, keep under it. And so I asked God, I said, I said, what's the purpose of this vision? And he said, this whole weekend for you has been to meet this man. And, and I saw Pastor Dave come in, and what Pastor Dave did in this vision is he got underneath you. And he carries with him a, a foundation of government authority, of kingdom authority. And there's, a, there's going to be a transfer of kingdom authority that you carry with you, that you have carried with you to this man. Because God said he's about to, he's about to give you more than you could have handled. He's about to give you more authority than you could have handled but in the, in the transferring of his kingdom authority that God has given him, that he's moved in, you will be able to handle that. Amen? And so I just believe, Pastor Dave, as you lay hands on him, there's going to be a, a tangible transference of, of the character, of the integrity, of the kingdom authority that you walk in for his ministry to go to a level that it's never seen. And it was funny because Kevin gave me a little uh, information about your ministry, a little bit about the history, and, and I had already had this word. God had already given me this word, and I believe it bears witness with your situation, that there's a time for you now to excel, a time for your ministry uh, to, to no longer backpedal but to t take, take off, to skyrocket. Amen? And it takes one king, King David, to transfer authority to King Enrique. Amen? You're a king, man. You're a king. When I looked at you, that's all I saw was a king. And a king rules and he reigns. A king subdues the land. A king dominates the forces. Amen? So, Pastor Dave, I believe as you lay hands on him and pray over him for this transferring of the kingdom authority that Hallelujah. Father, I just thank you that you've brought Enrique to our house, joined hearts. And we pray now, Father, just stretch your hands out, church. We pray for a fresh impartation of your kingdom, of your glory, of your power into his life and heart. I pray for an impartation of grace. 
Father, for any gifts in me that you would transfer through the laying on of hands to him, I pray for that impartation of strength and courage and boldness. 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 To speak the word of God with the strength and the courage to face these days and our culture in this nation and in his community with an unrelenting courage. He will not be even conscious of the faces of the people as he preaches the truth of God's Word. Power! Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Tonight, you have no idea what's about to come in the room. But what you just saw happen, I didn't talk to Jason, but it's very similar to what's going to come in this room. And I would highly, highly, highly encourage you, do not leave to the end of the meeting. Now, one of the things about me is I'm a very, very serious saint. I take the kingdom very seriously. And when people don't take it seriously, they get irritated by people who take it seriously. Did you hear what I said? If you don't take it seriously, you get irritated by people that take it seriously. And, and that's what the rub is. But the people who take it seriously, oh, they love it. They can't get enough. So I'm going to do one more prophetic thing, and then Trevor's going to come, and he's going to sing this song that we wrote this week, Deep Calls the Deep. How many enjoy that song? How, how many been, how many been hearing it in, in, their, in their sleep, and you've been hearing it? How, how many woke up Deep Calls the Deep, right? Okay, but let me just say, I don't sing songs just to sing songs. I'm hammering that thought, that nail, that God's about to unveil stuff. And that's the foundation. And the thing is that whatever the church sings is what they become. What the church sings is what they become, all right? Where's my couple at I was going to pray for? they here. Come on, run up here, come on. Come on, run. Let's go. We're wasting kingdom time. You walk in like this. Right here. Then make sure we get a video of it. Seth. Rachel. Change the flow of that. Make it more. Matter of fact, where's Clay at? Run up here, Clay. Come on, real quick. <laughs> it's not that you're not good, but there's something I want to get out of, out of this thing. Hey, they substitute players in the sports field all the time. Don't get all irritated about it. <laughs> She'll be back in the game. She'll be back in the game. <laughs> Seth, God is putting a mark on you today for ministry. And you're going to get washed in your mind today about using your authority and using your calling. And there's going to be a business anointing on you. And there's going to be a ministry anointing on you. And you're going to begin to find something is going to grab a hold of your heart today. And the Lord says, I'm cutting off your generations. I'm cutting off this function, son. You are going to be your family's hero. Somebody scream, family hero. Family hero. That's that loud enough. Say, family hero. And son, I'm going to do something inside of you that everybody's going to be amazed. Get your passport ready for the nations are going to be calling you in the days to come. And I'm going to put my hand on your mouth and my words in your mouth. And I'm going to open up supernatural eyesight, said the Spirit of God. This is your home. This is your home. And daughter, that pastoral grace to take care of people with mercy and love and kindness. Prepare the nursery, said the Lord. Prepare your own natural nursery. Because you're going to get children before you think that you want them, because I'm going to use those children to shape you. And when those children arrive, it's going to begin to call your family together. And I'm going to use the children to prophesy to your generation, said the Spirit of God. 
Now be released in authority. No condemnation. No shame. For this day, said the Lord, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. You're mine. No, oh, you're mine. You're mine. You're mine. All right, you can be seated. Is it all right? Okay, bring, bring my other keyboard player substitution back. Come on. Where's Nick at? You're back in. You're back in. Come on. You're back in the game. The you're back in the game. Ninth inning. Come on. Let's roll. Everybody say, authority, authority. Is, not authority is not authority until you use it. I'm looking for an end result in the meeting. I'm not trying to have a show, but there is an anointing in the atmosphere trying to come to the earth. Are you hearing me today? And we got to understand this, the role of music. Music is like a sponge to the anointing. How many of you can hold water in your hand? It's impossible to hold water in your hand without a vessel. But a sponge, you can hold water. And you can take that water in the sponge and squeeze it wherever you want to. Music does that. Music becomes a sponge for the present anointing, but it's got to be the, the song and the nature of that anointing have got to match. You cannot sing a song with a different destination, a different nature. Come on up here, Aaron. Come on. We're going to sing that song, Deep Cries Out to Deep. I'm not going to do any exhortation, but I want you to get excited. Is anybody hearing me? And I want you to sing with faith. Most Christians do not sing with faith. They may sing with enthusiasm, but they don't sing with faith. I want you to close your eyes and say, I'm calling out to the deep thing. Come on, see the Spirit of God calling you and pulling you. His water spout's about to fall over this congregation and it's going to suck you into a new thing. Ministers, deacons, businessmen, God is calling you up to a new thing. He doesn't want you to be mediocre. He said you're going to be the head and not the tail. And the way you become the head and not the tail is blessing and have the supernatural things revealed to you in the name of Jesus. Come on. Rise out, you can 
feel the roar. I am ready, I am ready. Send your waves to sweep me over. I am ready, I am ready to feel the rush, to feel the roar. I am ready, I am ready. Send your waves to sweep me over. I am ready, I am ready to feel the rush. Just the voices sing it out. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out. I am ready. I am ready. 
Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, bring the deep thing forth. Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, bring the deep thing forth. Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, will you bring the deep thing forth? Yes! Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, would you bring the deep thing Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, won't you bring the deep thing forth? Oh, whatever it takes, no matter the cost, won't you bring the deep thing forth? Whatever it takes, no matter the cost, won't you bring the deep thing forth? Oh, whatever it takes, no matter the cost, whatever it takes, Lord, I ask you to bring. A superstar, I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, no, I'm just anointed to fight his war. Hey, I am not a superstar, just anointed. Fight his war. I am not a superstar. I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. No, I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight his war. Superstar, no, I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar, just anointed to fight his war. 
find is more. I am not a superstar, just a man. I am ready, I am ready. Send your ways to sweep me over. I am ready, I am ready to feel the rush, to feel the roar. Just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight the fight. War. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight his war. Lift up your back. Lift up your battle cry, yeah. Be aggressive, say that. I am not a superstar. I'm just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight his war. I am not a superstar. Just anointed to fight his war. Superstar, just in order to find his way. The church becomes what the church sings. The church becomes in spirit and in truth what they sing. And Lord, we call forth for a new generation of songwriters and songs for this church that as they advance in the mission of God, they will have a song that they can sing as they do warfare and conquer the families and the society and the community that has been lacking in this place. Come on, just raise your hands and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. Let, the Spirit of this song let the Spirit of this song 
rise in me. Rise in me. And I will conquer. And I will, conquer. And I will colonize. And I, will colonize. And, I am on. and I am on your kingdom mission, your kingdom mission. To, my to my area, to my family, to my, to my region. Will somebody give the Lord a mighty hand of applause? How many feel something electric in the atmosphere? Let me just say that what you feel could not have happened on Wednesday. But as you remove your stones and you break up your fallow ground and you get rid of your demons and your bad attitudes... Something rises where it's easier for your spirit to touch the deep thing. Just make sure you got the headphones on and you get all that echo out. Man, there's something in this atmosphere tonight. It's so good. Truth, facts, and knowledge outside of the proper context leads to educated insanity. If I have truth, if I have facts, if I have knowledge about the Bible, knowledge of God, but it's outside of God's context, it's educated insanity. Insanity is something that is not what God has in mind when he made us. Without understanding the gospel and context of warfare and conquest, a building community, a building tribe, a building team, you will always have a continual frustration because it's outside of God's context. And if you see the scriptures outside of warfare, outside of community, outside of team, outside of tribe, you will always miss God's mark for your life. Now both Jesus and Paul use contemporary culture to explain the kingdom of God to their generation. Paul used athletic events as a comparison. He used Roman armor to compare what God wants to do with us. He used the concept of Roman adoption. Jesus used various illustrations about farming and fishing because he wanted to connect the kingdom of God to the thinking of his generation. Well, tonight I'm going to do the same thing. But I'm going to use a contemporary movie illustration that all of us probably know. I'm going to use the concept of Star Trek, the science fiction TV shows and movies that we've seen since the 60s to illustrate the kingdom of God, and it has become part of our Western culture. But I'm going to use a specific episode in Star Trek to amplify and illustrate what God wants for this church and every church, but specifically in this time and this moment. In the fictitious universe of Star Trek, in the fictitious universe of Star Trek, the Pine Directive is the guiding principle of the United Federation of Planets. The prime directive prohibits Starfleet personnel from interfering with the internal development of alien civilizations. This conceptual law applies particularly to civilizations which are below a certain threshold. This conceptual law applies particularly to civilizations that are below a certain threshold of development. It prevents starship crews from using their superior technology to impose their own values or ideals upon them. This is called the prime directive. But we are directly opposite of that prime directive. We are to use our superior technology in the spirit, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, healing, prophecy, to convert this, to convert this generation and to colonize it for the kingdom. But the concept of the prime directive as the operating mindset of the Star Trek people can be used to train you and let you understand that God does too have a prime directive. He has his own prime directive to colonize the earth. Now when art imitates kingdom life in movies or plays or song, many times the religious people say that's evil, that's worldly. But if you understand that every single person has the kingdom dynamic woven in their heart, and without seeing Jesus and the Bible pattern, they still search after the kingdom. One of the greatest movies to illustrate kingdom truth in our generation is the movie The Matrix, the first Matrix movie, because it talks about the invisible world that nobody sees but is there. 
And he talks about the people that take the blue pill or the red pill, either they forget about it or they enter into the reality of what's really, really happening. And so in the Star Trek siloquies or the Star Trek movies and television programs, it imitates what kingdom life is supposed to be. Here are some of the similarities in Star Trek to kingdom life. Number one, there's a mission into the unknown. It takes faith and courage to be on that mission. You always see leadership examples in Star Trek movies, whether it's guys leading, women leading, or people challenging their leadership. You always see a lot of team interaction. The entire family is on the mission. The starship is not just a battleship, but it is a community. It's not just the officers, but it's their family, just like we're supposed to have. It's a flying city. They have advanced weapons. They have strategy. They use power. They use authority. There's loyalty. There's sacrifice, but there's also envy and jealousy. And so tonight, using this illustration of the prime directive, we too have a prime directive. It is the kingdom agenda. And so I've selected a short clip that we're going to play right now, and I want you to understand how they take the prime directive the wrong way. Now, here's why this is so invaluable. They are arguing about how to apply the prime directive on a different mission. The pros and the cons. We are supposed to bring the kingdom of God to every part of society. But the bad part is if we don't have a constant communication with the king, we will end up just like these Starfleet officers. Biblical teaching and knowledge without a sense of eternal mission is nothing more than a religious merry-go-round in church without any power. Or if you have power, it becomes a roller coaster in the churches that have spiritual power, and they always end up where they started. No matter how exciting the ride is on a merry-go-round or roller coaster, you end up where you started. And that's so many churches. I've been going here for 20 years, but I'm at the same place where I started. I hear a lot of stuff, but nothing is changing. Our God is the God of history. But without a sense of divine mission, you can walk past your historical opportunity. We are not here just to go to church. We are here to change history. I said we're not here just to go to a meeting. We're here to change the history of West Virginia and Ohio and beyond. When you write a check, Jesus Christ changed history. They had to reset the calendar because of his birth. Earth has been going on a longer time than 2,000 years. But we date our checks to the interest of the Lord in society. And if he's in hue, you should change history wherever you go. You should be a world shaker and a history maker. I said you should be a world shaker and a history maker. I'm going to say it again. You ought to be a world shaker and a history maker. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 18 said this. Where there is no vision or revelation, the people perish or they cast off restraint. The word perish really means a piece of fruit that comes to maturity that never gets picked. You just rot on the vine. And unless you enlist in the sense of mission, you're perishing. Your potential, your gifts, your future relationships, they're all perishing. And this sense of kingdom mission is our prime directive. His presence has a purpose. If you talk about presence without purpose, it becomes a merry-go-round or a roller coaster, and you end up at the same place. What people mistakenly call revival is just a refreshing where God's trying to get people back into his presence so he can put them on a mission. Just because you go to a church doesn't mean you're on a mission. The mission is not to go to the church meeting. This is the enlistment office. And the more you get connected to the Lord, his purpose becomes more and more clear, and then his presence becomes more and more pronounced. 
Let me connect purpose and presence together because wherever there is no purpose, presence diminishes. God gives you that introduction presence where he awakens you. Everything is wonderful. Man, I feel God. I, didn't you like those meetings? But what was the purpose of the presence? We go from glory to glory to glory or image to image to image or assignment to assignment to assignment or mission to mission to mission. Romans chapter 8, verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and to those that are called according to his purpose. Well, I understand why that happened to me and nothing ever good ever came out of it because you were out of purpose. And there are many under my voice, you're out of purpose. And if you're out of purpose, you're in perversion. Perversion means it is a distortion of the original intention that God has. If you're out of purpose, the presence gets more and more and more diminished. And so the further you are out of purpose, God will send the presence to rescue you and bring you back. I will tell you in the Western nations, the majority of the presence of God is to rescue people. They're not following Jesus He's rescuing them from their own dysfunction. He's rescuing them from their bad choices because they did not make choices from the presence. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. Who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. Everybody shout, purpose and grace. If I preach grace without connecting to the purpose, it will always end up in perversion. If I preach grace without connecting it to divine purpose, it will always, always, always end in some form of perversion. You were made for a divine purpose. Everything in you is about a divine purpose. And the way that you begin this journey of mission is not seeing needs on the earth. Jesus was not led by needs. He was led by the voice of the Father. And some of you are God's little helpers. Jesus had no problem walking past sick people because his main assignment in the earth was not healing people. His main assignment was not casting out demons. His main assignment was the training of the 12. Jesus would be in a meeting with sick people and he trained the 12, he said, do it this way, do it that way, because he knew he had a limited amount of time, just like all of us. All of us have a limited amount of time. I can see Jesus with these large crowds healing the sick and there are more and more people are coming, but he's got the 12 he's training. And finally he said, this is enough. But Jesus, there's still sick people. He said, this is enough. Back up the boat. And he would walk backward to the boat, get in the boat, say goodbye, see you later. Why? His purpose wasn't to heal everybody. His purpose was to train the 12 because he knew his time was limited. And if you don't have a sense you're being trained for a divine purpose, you're on that roller coaster or that merry-go-round. And you will end up in perversion. And then you're going to live on other people's presence. Oh, I love Psalmist Clay's album. I feel the presence when I play it. Well, I'm wonderful. I'm happy you feel the presence, but and then what? Everybody say, and then what? And then what? Come on, shout, and then, what? and then what? I don't care how strong the anointing is. There always has to be a? And then what? I don't care how major the miracle is. There always has to be a? I don't care how awesome the altar call is. There always has to be a? And it takes a team to have the, and then what? You've got to know your purpose. Your purpose, number one, is to him. But if you don't have a local church where you're identified and governed and plugged in, you're missing in action for the mission. Well, Kevin, I'm going to go to heaven. Yeah, but your family probably won't. Jesus' entire purpose was the training of the twelve. 
He left no books. He left no money. He left no buildings. He left no organization. All he left was 12, but they had been trained. In John 17, he says, Father, I have finished the work. What was the work? I trained the 12. You'll never, ever, ever have enough time or resources to change your generation without duplicating yourself. That was his main assignment. But now we want to turn our attention to God himself. A.W. Tozer, who was an awesome writer, I encourage you to read some of his stuff, he said these words, what comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. How you see him is how you serve him. I said, how you see him is how you serve him. As you look at the Old Testament narrative where the patriarchs got visitation, they were dry, dead, situational people. But then they got a revelation of God's nature and they become heroes. The way I see him is the way I serve him. You say, well, Kevin, how will I know my purpose? The way you know your purpose is the kind of visitation and deep thing that's revealed to you. You don't decide who you are. You discover who you are after your visitation. The kingdom of God is moved forward by visitation to visitation. And so we got to put God in his rightful place in our hearts. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 but sanctify the Lord God in your hearts and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you for a reason by the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. The word sanctify means to put something in the right place, to set apart. When God visits you, he's setting himself apart in your heart. In my life as a young boy, I didn't have any idea about God. I saw statues and bells and smells. I saw men in costumes. I thought that was God in the Catholic Church and in those rituals. But when I began to read the Bible, he began to visit me as Jesus the prophet. First he came as Jesus the Savior. Then he came as Jesus the sanctifier, got me out of my mess. Then I began to say, Lord, I want to serve you. And I began to get a visitation of Jesus the prophet. I didn't choose it. I was chosen. I said, I did not choose it. I was chosen. And one of the things about prophets in all fivefold ministries, you got to understand something. You're not elected. You're selected. That's why you can't be fired. There's a lot of people working that God fired them a long time ago, but they keep their job because men keep paying them. How do you know that you're fired? He stops revealing himself to you. The way you know you're fired in the spirit is that God quits talking to you about people. No more flow. You can keep your job with man, but you lost it with God. So to sanctify God in your heart, that's not a one-time thing. That means I place him in the dimension that he reveals himself. And I will tell you that most of American Christians and Western Christians have a low, low, low view of who God is. They don't really see him for who he is. And all great missions start with re-seeing Christ and re-seeing God in their rightful place. You will never live beyond your vision of how you see him. You will never serve God and be serious beyond how you see him. And I'm sorry, pastors, but if you have people that are unfaithful, the real issue is how they see the pastor. No, how they see God. People are only as faithful and committed to how they see him. You become a self-motivator. And so when you show people all kind of wounded people and hurting people, they're hurting people. Look at them. They're hurting. They're lost. And if I do that, I'm only going to be moved by human need and I will fail because I'll run out of resources and energy. But if I see him, I see him high and lifted up and I see him in action and I see him coming from that high place, coming in me, then he becomes the source of my purpose and I'm always going to have the presence with me. Always, 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 always. So the first thing we got to understand 
is that God lives in eternity. We got to get this thing. Most people never, never meditate enough about who and what God is to be the fuel of their ministry. They hear a word, they hear some music, but they never meditate. The word meditate means to roll in your mind over and over and over certain truths or certain thoughts. I spend more time meditating on truth than I do trying to figure out and pray about it. Why? Because when I get the meditation of Christ in that truth, something happens inside of me. Meditation is a key revelation that God has in the scriptures. First Timothy chapter 1, verse 17. I love this scripture. Now to the king of eternity, or king eternal, incorruptible, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever and ever. It puts him as king of the universe. Hear me. When you feel his presence, it's not just a feeling. It's the king in his kingdom. When you feel his presence, it's not a light thing. It's the Lord of creation walking among the candlesticks. When you feel his presence, it's the shepherd, the chief shepherd walking among the sheep. But if you don't see him high and lifted up, you treat his presence with irreverence. Did you feel something? Oh, I felt the Lord here was good. I, I was happy it was good. It's it pleasant. I love, I love Clay's music. I love, I, love, I love when Trevor sang that song. I felt something. But the presence has a purpose. Somebody shout, his presence has a purpose. And it's not just the presence, it's the king, immortal, invisible, the only wise God that's walking in the house. The fear of God doesn't talk about anything other than seeing him in his rightful place. Whenever you see somebody that's unfaithful, unyielding, the real issue, they have never sanctified the Lord or set him in the right place in their heart. We got church members that have the pastor hire than the Lord. They have the work higher than the Lord. They even have the anointing higher than the Lord. I want the anointing. Pray that we lay hands on me. I got the anointing. I got the anointing. See, it's easy to get addicted to the anointing. You know why? Because you feel God, very God, flowing through you. But if you don't sanctify the Lord, the anointing will kill you because it'll just wear you out. I want you to say these words, say, people in pain, people in pain. Don't, care about me. don't care about me. People in pain, people in pain. Don't, care about don't care about my family. People in pain, people in pain. Don't, care my don't care about my budget. All they care about, they care about. is getting out, of pain. getting out of pain. I can't be led by other people's pain. I cannot be led by other people's pain. I got to be led by the voice of the Lord, and I got to do that when I sanctify him in my heart. Everybody shout the word Jehovah. Jehovah. Shout the word Jehovah. Jehovah. The word Jehovah is translated Lord in most English-speaking Bibles. Whenever you see the word Lord, it's the word Jehovah. But the word Jehovah, or Lord, has a much deeper meaning dissimilar to what we just got through reading in 1 Timothy. It means the self-existent one. It is the Jewish natural name. It is the Jewish national name that I will protect this nation. I cause it to come into existence. I'll protect it. I'll provide for it as long as you put me in my rightful place. Now, how does that go for Christians today? Because we are in the same lineage. And so when we say the word Jehovah, a Lord, it's the self-existent God who is ruling on his throne, all-powerful, all-knowing, all-seeing. And that's the God who wants to come into this church. But if you don't see him high and lifted up, you don't see him as the God of the ages intervening with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, You'll just come to a church, hear a message of principles, and go home. Our faith must be in the risen Christ. Our faith must be in the risen Christ, but we've got to see his father high and lifted up. Now, in the Jewish concept of Jehovah, 
They had this concept of God, immoral, invisible, all-powerful, all-knowing. But then they took the word Jehovah and they connected it to what they call the redemptive names of God. Everybody say, the redemptive, the redemptive. Names, of God. names of God. So it's Jehovah hyphen something. Now, why is this important? In the Old Testament, God revealed himself by his acts. I'm Jehovah that does this. I'm the self-motivating, eternal God that does it for my own reasons, that nobody can challenge my authority. I'm all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-present. So let me give you these eight redemptive names of God. There's a few more, but let me just focus on the eight. Jehovah Jireh, my provider. The Lord that sees the future and has provision for it. Jehovah Nisi, our banner of love and protection. Moses called God Jehovah Nisi after one of his battles with the Amalekites. Jehovah Shalom, our perfect peace. Jehovah Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. Jehovah Shama, the Lord who is omnipresent. Jehovah Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, our protector. Jehovah Ra, the Lord who leads us like a shepherd and guides us. Jehovah Rapha, I am the Lord, your position or your healer. And there's many more names that God will reveal himself and your ministry for him comes from your revelation from him. Your ministry to him is what gives you the revelation and then out of that revelation you have a ministry for him. I cannot do everything. There's a lot of things I'm not anointed for. Well, Kevin, you, you're called of God. You're not, no, 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 I've never seen that part of Jesus. I've never seen that nature. And that's why team is so absolutely critical because some people have seen a part of him I've never seen. So we're going to talk about the prime directive. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. And if you understand the prime directive, you will have success no matter where you go because it's an eternal prime directive. It's how God does everything in the earth. It started in Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Let God, let us make man in our image. Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over cattle, over all the earth over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. So God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the air, over every living thing that moves on the earth. This is a part of the prime directive. We have a kingdom mandate to take over the earth. Genesis chapter two, verse 15. Then the Lord took man and put him in the garden of Eden. The word Eden means delight or good to take care of it and to cultivate it. God puts you in something called a garden. That means it's not going to take a breakthrough. It's going to take a grow through. If you're married, your house is your garden. Your marriage is your garden. But you don't just get one garden. According to your ability, you get many gardens. Your business is a garden. Your place in this church is a garden. It's something that God says, protect it and cultivate it. Everybody say, protect it and cultivate it. Protect it and cultivate it. And the reason that's important is because that's part of the prime directive. And when God sees you taking care of the thing he gave you, he gives you more and more and more and more. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth, and he breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and man became a living being. And the Lord planted a garden eastward of Eden, and there he put man whom he had formed. And so here's what we see. We see God making something alive and putting you in your garden. Now, all these meetings this week, we felt presence. We've had good teaching on the worship. We've had good teaching on God's glory. But all of that is to make you alive. Now you've got to find your garden. Come on, raise your say, Holy Spirit. Open my eyes to my garden. Let me see all my gardens. And when you find that garden, you got to protect it and cultivate it. Cultivation means it's not automatic. You got to do the work of a farmer. You got to break up the ground, take out the rocks, plant the seed, water it, prune it, nurture it. And for some of you in the ministry, 
They are your garden. Hear me. God does not take it lightly when he has somebody get ordained to a position. It's a big deal. It's the king of the universe that puts you in that place. And when you leave your responsibility, it's a big deal to the king. You disrupt his prime directive. You know, a couple of years ago, I was reading in the book of Numbers, and it starts talking about different sins that God hates. And it gets to the end of the chapter, and it said, these sins God hates, and I'm going to scrape off the people because of these sins. You know what those sins were? Homosexuality, child murder, and bestiality. Homosexuality, child murder, and bestiality. I said, well, Lord, I know you hate sin, but why these three sins? He said, I can recover any sin but these three. What do you mean you can recover any sin but these three? He said, I have to have people to run my prime directive. Homosexuality, no people. Child murder, no people. Bestiality, no people. No people, no prime directive. That's why he said, be fruitful and multiply. He wasn't talking about getting people saved. He was talking about having babies in your garden and raising them up as godly seed. Is anybody hearing me? Well, I only want to have two babies because they're so expensive. Who gave you the right to tell the king you only want to have two babies? Who gave you the right to say, I'm going to shut the doorway to heaven to this child? You're messing with the prime directive. You're messing with the prime directive. The Spirit of God is here today to breathe on you again. Why? Whenever men fails, he has the same process. He breathes on them and puts them in a garden. How many, felt have, how many have felt breathe on this week? How many have felt something stirring up? You feel like the breath of God got on you. Now it's time to find your garden and to protect it and to nurture it, to protect it and cultivate it. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 down to verse 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came the sound of heaven like a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared in divided tongues as a fire. And one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now why is this important? In the garden, God breathed on a couple. But in the day of Pentecost, he breathed on the church. Why? He wants to put you in the garden. He wants to give you an extreme revelation of who he is. And what happens with people that have no passion, no drive, no faithfulness, the real issue is how you see the Lord. Because you relate to him, you have never sanctified the Lord in your heart. And he has many, many different names and faces that he wants to be revealed by inside of us. You will never exhaust the revelation of who he is in your heart. When you look at the book of Revelation and the 24 elders, they're going, holy, holy, holy. And the Bible says they bow down because they're so overwhelmed by what they see. And then a few moments later, they raise up again, and he has changed to a different image. And they go, holy, holy, holy. They're like, my goodness, he's even more glorious. And then they fall down and worship him again. And they say that all eternity is going to be like that, changing and changing and changing. But here's the thing. When they see him change, they behold him, they are changed. It is not just worship. I am changed in his presence, beholding and becoming. The more I see him, the more I behold him, the more I become like him. And when you see people that are not faithful and loving and secure, the issue is they have doctrine, but they've never seen the Lord sanctified in their hearts. Come on, I want you to raise your hands and say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit. I'm, hungry I'm hungry for a new revelation, a new revelation. Of, almighty of Almighty God. Let me see the King of Eternity. Let me see the King of Eternity. And so when Jesus began to teach the disciples, he's really given them the prime directive, the kingdom message. It's not just about having a church. 
It's much, much greater than that. Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, down to verse 15. In this manner, therefore, pray. He's giving him the prayer of the prime directive. Our Father in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This is the prime directive. Give us the day our daily bread. That's how it comes. Forgive our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. If you forgive man their trespasses, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is the kingdom mandate. This is a part of it. Hear me. Today, God is commissioning every one of us. Well, brother, you're called to the fivefold ministry. No, you're called to be a son and a daughter, and you're part of the prime directive. Say, I am part, I am part of, his of his prime directive. Come on, say, I am part, I am part of, his prime directive. of his prime directive. My life is not my own. My life is not my own. Raise the volume much higher. Much higher. My life is not my own. Like thunder. My life is not my own. Like thunder. My life is not my own. And that's the reason you carry your cross. When your plans conflict with the prime directive of the bringing the kingdom where he wants you, you lose. Now you can go all the way you want to, but you desanctify the Lord in your heart. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. Now, we're talking about being commissioned for the prime directive. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. That's the king immortal speaking. Go, therefore, and do what? Have meetings. Go, therefore, and have worship meetings. Go, therefore, have burns and 24-hour worship. That's part of it. That's a good part. But what did he say to do? What's the end result? make disciples we have a generation of consumer christians this church has a lot of consumer christians i'm just going to come and get my praise on i'm gonna get a word i'm gonna guess what i'm gonna get healed but you never stay true to your christian mission you never stay true to the prime directive and the problem is when you get out of the purpose the presence begins to diminish and then perversion grabs a hold of you Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. The word nation there is the Greek word ethnos, which means people groups. You don't have to go to Africa to to minister to Africans. You don't got to go to Mexico to minister to Mexicans. It just means all the different kind of people groups in the earth. He said, I've assigned you to all the people groups. Baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all the things that I have commanded you. And lo, check it out. I am with you always. That means his presence is permanent when you're on the mission. Say, his presence is permanent when I'm in my purpose. His presence is permanent as long as I stay in the purpose. His presence has a purpose. And you can be out of God's presence for a long time, coming to a meeting like this, and he breathes on you. Man, I feel my sins are gone. I repented of all my mess. I I feel better. You want to feel really better? Go repent in person. Go repent in person. The Bible calls it restitution. You know, we have a lot of generations of people in this church. You say one thing, live the other. This is a yearly conference, and if you're part of of the team of this church, and you didn't reschedule as much as you could your vacations, your time to be here, then you're not on the mission. You're a spectator, not a participator. Even if you have talent. Every year, our conference in our church, for the last 18 years, I've rescheduled my agenda to fit it because I'm part of the mission. I'm part of that house. It has some kind of a priority. Now, there are some reasons that sometimes you can't because of physical issues or family's death or whatever. 
but you prioritize around your priorities. And if this, is not a pri- if this church is not a priority with you, don't fool yourself. You're not on the mission. You're just coming to the building to hear some words. You're missing an action. And I'm telling you, God will begin to let things fall apart for you. He will chastise you to get you back on your mission. Well, you don't understand. They were mean to me. Some of you, you get mad about anything. You're still mad at your daddy. You transfer it to Pastor Dave. Come on, you got unresolved daddy issues, mommy issues. Do you think it's going to be easy being on the mission? Here's the issue. The king eternal looks at you and he says, stay in place because others are building and trusting your faithfulness to touch their life. It's not just you, it's generations. I said, it's not just you, it's generations. His presence has a purpose. Stay in your garden. Protect your garden. Nurture your garden. Have anointing, we'll travel. I'm the guy, I'm the the floater, tumbleweed Christian center. In the West, they have what they call tumbleweeds. These big bushes that they dry up, they lose their roots, and they just roll all over the place. They're dangerous on the highway. They're just a nuisance. Are you a nuisance to this church, or are you in your purpose? Are you in your purpose? And your purpose will grow from image to image to image. Now, we've had a wonderful time of the presence He breathed on you. There's been a time of refreshing. (sighs) Now go find your garden. Look at your neighbor and say, go find your garden and be faithful in your garden. Go find your garden and be faithful. See, a lot of you can't even turn because you were the unfaithful telling somebody to be faithful. You're having a hard time telling anybody else something because you unfaithful, you hypocrite. You not faithful. And you tell you need to be faithful to your God. You not faithful. And that's why you had a hard time turning your head. You don't have a stiff neck. You got a stiff heart. I said, you don't have a stiff neck. You got a stiff heart. You can't turn your neck because your heart is stiff. His purpose contains the presence. And Satan will always try to get you out of your purpose. And as some of you, you let little things that people do knock you out of your eternal purpose. Do you think I like every pastor of the churches I go to when I first meet them? Man, a lot of the pastors I go to are like, what a jerk. I do that. I had a guy one time, he said, Kevin, you're going to that guy's church? He's horrible, he's a jerk. Why are you going? I said, didn't you read your Bible? Prophets are called to graveyards. Where else should I go to than when the jerk people are? If you have an anointing to turn the jerk to a saint, that's where you need to be. Did you not get the revelation from heaven about whatever you're called to, you get the opposite? I said, whatever you're called to, you get the opposite. Anybody here feel called to a teaching ministry? Well, guess who you get? Ignorant people. Anybody here feel called to the prophetic ministry? You get religious people. I feel called to a healing. You get sick people. Do you think Brian Adams feel depressed when he sees sick people? Oh, Jesus, a bunch of sick people. (laughs) Lord, can't you give me some healthy people? No, he gets excited. His purpose is amplified and activated with sick people in the room. If you get healed of my meaning, it's an accident. (laughs) Uh, Prophet Kevin, I was in your meaning and I got healed. I said, really? I got got unbelief. Really? Really? Are you sure? (laughs) That lady came to me. She says, Prophet Kevin. I said, yes. She goes, when you were preaching, my eye popped open. Here was my exact response. Really? (laughs) 
Because Jesus, the healer, has not been sanctified in my heart because he never revealed himself. But you got a devil? Oh, come over here. You got religion? I'm your man. You got false dysfunctional thinking? Come on, baby. Because that's the name of Jesus that's been sanctified in my heart. You always get the opposite. Hear me. Do you know why there's not greater churches in America? Because it takes more God to live in team than to be a solo player. It takes a whole bunch of God to put up with immaturity. You ever read the Bible where Jesus groaned? The Bible said Jesus went, how, how much longer must I be with you? He said, Jesus, how much longer must I be with you? I'm sure he said it over most of you one time. <laughs> West Virginia, how much longer shall I be with you? <laughs> oh, the rock church. Well, let me give you the revelation. Has anybody ever raised teenagers? <laughs> Same groan. <laughs> I almost killed myself with the skateboard you didn't put up, son. Son, I ran over your bicycle with my car because you didn't put it up. Is anybody hearing what I'm saying? You know, when my, my sons were, especially one son, had a younger son named Ryan. And he would always put all the dirt under his bed. Son, did you clean your room? Yeah, Mom, I cleaned my room. But she had a prophetic word. She goes, did you clean your room, Ryan? Yeah, yeah, I cleaned my room. She would say, is it Mommy clean? Somebody say, mommy clean. mommy clean. That means, did you clean like mommy would? Uh, I'll be right back. <laughs> Look at you and go, uh. Look at you and go, uh. If you're not in your purpose, that's how God feels about you. He loves you, but uh. Immaturity won't stay in the garden. Immaturity won't stay in place. And if there's no fruit, you're not called. Well, I feel I'm called to the youth. Pastor, I feel I really, really want to work with the youth. I, I feel called to the youth. Uh, uh, God's called me to the youth. Okay, we'll put you with the youth. We put you there, they got 50 youth. You've been there six weeks, now we're down to 25. <laughs> come here, brother, come here, come here. You're not called to the youth. Why? I love the youth. Yeah, but they don't love you. <laughs> they text. They're boring. Nobody's changing. You're in the wrong garden, brother. You just like to study, and you're looking for somebody to talk to. You ever seen a preacher? He don't, he don't have a good preacher. He just likes to talk a lot. And blah, 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 blah. hey, dude, shut up. Nobody's getting alive in you. You're in the wrong garden. When the breath of God comes, then he puts you in a garden. And he says, make disciples. Mark 16, 16. He that believes and is baptized will be saved, and he that does not believe shall be condemned. And these signs shall follow those that believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. That's people, not real snakes. I know in West Virginia you got some snake handling churches. Uh, brother, do you got the power? I heard you, prophet, do you got the power? If you got the power, pick up the snake. You know what I got more of? Wisdom. You keep your snake, brother. <laughs> He's not talking about actual serve. He's talking about people. Use the Bible to interpret the Bible. When the Pharisees came to be baptized, John the Baptist says, snakes, vipers. He said, you will be able to deal with serpent people. And some of you, the first time a serpent raises his head, you out the building. You know, I was working in the sound, but, you know, they made me mad. I was working on the cameras, and they made me mad. I was working in the restaurant, and they made me mad. So, so, get over it. That's your garden. Protect your garden. Be faithful in your garden. And some of you, the main ministry you have is the excuse ministry. You're full of excuses. And then we got the disappearing saints. You just disappear. 
did the rapture take place or was it Enoch? Uh, and then God came and he was not. He was not in the sound. He was not on the camera. He was not in the... And God came and he was not. You know why you're not there? Because you're immature. Don't make a commitment if God didn't tell you to do it, but if God told you to do it, you didn't betray your pastor. You betrayed the king, immortal, invisible. For you live unto him. One of the most valuable anointings in the church is the sound department. You know why? If they weren't there, here's what you'd hear from my message. No hallelujahs, because you would not do nothing. Is anybody hearing me? Wherever God calls you to be is important to the king. Wherever God calls you to be, it's important to the king. And there's a lot of jobs that you don't get an hallelujah and a praise and appreciation from man. You got to go to the king. I respect the people that serve and they're not in front of a camera or a microphone. It takes more anointing to be in those silent places. There's a lot of preachers, they get their applause from people. That's their reward. But you got to get your reward from a king. You got to have the Lord say, well done, daughter, for bringing the people that food because you committed to be in the restaurant. Well done, son. You committed to park cars. Well done, son. You with the children. Sanctify the Lord in your heart. Find your garden, and you'll find your presence. Find the place that God wants you. The prime directive is to colonize the earth. The prime directive is to colonize the earth. And what's going to happen is that when you commit to a garden, God gives you the download to guard it and to nurture it. You know, I found out I was a prophet called the churches. I would go to churches and I would start getting dreams about the church. This week, this week, I bet you I've had 10 people come to me and said, Kevin, you were in one of my dreams last night. Kevin, you were in one of my dreams, and this happened. I said, hmm, I must be assigned here. I haven't had one good night's sleep the whole time I've been here. 429, 515, the Lord's waking me up. Hey, let me talk to you about the rock. Let me talk to you about my people. Every time I come and visit the church, the same thing happens. To some church, I can sleep all night. How was your sleep like that? I slept all the way, brother, all the way. Did the Lord talk to you about this? No, no, he didn't talk to me nothing about you. Man, he's always waking you up about this church. Acts chapter 2, verse 17 and 18. God always, always sends his presence to purpose. Hear me. If you feel his presence, you got to ask yourself, why did he come to me? Why did God visit me? Did he come to make you alive? Or did he come to put you on assignment? Did he come to make you alive? Or did he come to put you on assignment? Acts chapter 2, verse 17. And it shall come to pass in the last days. The word last days doesn't mean like it's ending. It means this space of time that God has designated for this to happen. We're always going to be in the last days until you go to heaven. This is the last of the days. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, I will pour out of what? My spirit. That means the king is pouring on you. It's not the holy, I don't have an identity ghost. It's the king himself that is visiting you. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. They're talking about the fivefold ministry. They're talking about the sons and the daughters. Your young men shall see visions, your old men shall dream dreams. On my men servants and on my maid servants, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they shall prophesy. Here's why. Because you're on assignment. You're on an assignment. God does not give stuff just to be giving it. I remember years ago, I was in this prophetic meeting, and 
this guy was getting all these downloads about stuff that was happening in America, and there's going to be a hurricane over here, and watch out, this is going to happen, and this guy's going to get elected. And I was going, huh. I said, Lord, why don't you show me any of that kind of stuff? We had a hurricane hit Pensacola. We had a hurricane hit Pensacola, and you could see hurricanes seven, eight days out. They said, Kevin, is it going to come to the left or right? I says, I don't have a clue. Well, you're a prophet. I'm not a hurricane prophet. <laughs> you ain't telling me nothing about no hurricane. And I said, Lord, tell me some stuff. He said, son, I only speak on purpose. I only speak on purpose. He says, you don't need to know that because that's not your assignment. You're just being a busybody. You're just meddling. Go over and be what I told you to be. Quit meddling with everybody else. He speaks on purpose. I said the Lord speaks on purpose. Brian, if he told you to go to an Indian revelation, if he told you to go to an Indian reservation, that's the king immortal, the only wise God saying, Brian Adams, that's your place in my kingdom for today, and I will breathe on you. God only speaks in purpose. There's a lot of people. They want to be in the full-time ministry. I always get people to say to me, Kevin, I want to be in the full-time ministry. You what? I want to be in the full-time ministry. You know what always irritates me? You're a part-time Christian that wants to be in a full-time ministry. I said, you're a part-time Christian, but you want to be in the full-time ministry. You don't pray. You don't support anything. You're not in your garden. You'll knock down a faithful person to get your prophecy. Excuse me, excuse me, excuse me. I, have a, I want a word from Kevin. Be very careful before you get in my prophecy line. Because if you're crooked, you're going to get a word that will straighten your character out. Uh, Private Kevin, can I get a word from you? You really want a word from me? You lazy. You don't read your Bible. You're not faithful. Anything else you want? No, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> and Private Kevin, I want to be in a full-time ministry. God has given me a wonderful voice. Let me hear you sing. Oh, you do have a wonderful voice, but a horrible character. Disqualified. Why do you want to be in a full-time ministry and you're a part-time Christian? Show me your disciples. Show me your fruit. Show me your garden. His purpose magnetized the presence. And there's people here right now. Here's the name of your church. Magic Kingdom Christian Center. You think it's going to be magic. It's work. And if you won't be faithful and work in the small things, you're in Magic Land Christian Center. And we got people, they want magic miracle beans like Jack and the Beanstalk. They read this guy's thing. They get on the Internet. He says, man, I got a truth. These are my magic ministry beans. If I plant these beans, I'll have a mega church. Have a me no, you won't. You cannot improve on the method of Jesus. You cannot improve on this method. And so with all this presence, God is saying, find your garden. Find the place that I called you to protect and guide. And he says, I'm going to begin to send these kind of manifestations. Dreams, visions, prophecy, armies of angels, miracles, healing, signs of provision, words of knowledge, words of wisdom, special discernment, laying on of hands. You're going to begin to have all these visitations. Why? It's part of the prime directive. He said, I will not leave you an orphan. And if you don't have a daily stream of God giving you some kind of supernatural stuff, either you're not in your assignment or you're not seeking God or you're in the wrong garden. The prime directive. The prime directive. I said the prime directive. Now, many of you in this room today, you need to rethink your Christian life. You need to rethink your assignment to the garden God put you in. 
This is Wednesday night, not Sunday morning. Sunday morning, I would never preach this message. Why? You have believers, you have all kind of people, but this is the disciple message. At the end of a conference, it was great. Man, we had an awesome conference. And then what? Did you find your garden? Did you find your garden? God is going to walk in the garden with purpose. Is Clay here? God is going to walk in the garden with purpose. He always comes to purpose. He always comes to purpose. Now he's going to play this song about the garden. And when he does, there are going to be two reactions. Either you're going to feel safe and secure that I'm in my garden, or you're going to feel like, man, I am not in my garden. The prime directive never changed. God breathes on you. He makes you alive, and he puts you in your garden to guard and keep it. There are people that are assigned to you. Do you understand that the majority of ministry in the New Testament is bivocational? That means you got two jobs. Well, I want to get paid for serving in the kingdom of God. Can I tell you, if you can get out of it, run, you got some fantasy about being on full-time ministry. You know how you spell problems? P-E-O-P-L-E. Well, I want a big church. That's big problems. I would much rather be in full-time ministry because that's something I have to do. I'll preach for free. I'll preach for free. I'm not going to try that this weekend. I want to get paid, but I'll preach for free. <laughs> I witnessed at 10 people a day for six years. I witness everywhere I go. And some of you, you want to be in full-time ministry but you don't have anybody you led to the Lord this year. Well, Brother Kevin, I want to be in full-time ministry. Would you lay hands on me for full-time ministry? Show me your disciples right now. Show me where you've been faithful in somebody's garden. Oh, excuse me. Oh, uh, sorry. Let me pull your tithing record. Let me look at your family. Can I tell you that the greatest garden you can ever serve in is your family? A lot of you went to Bible school and got a certificate, but your family stinks. Your ministry credentials are your family. I was up in Guatemala about 10 years ago, and I was prophesying with a little Guatemalan woman. She wasn't no bigger than a minute, probably weighed about 80 pounds, indigenous Indian woman up in the mountains. And her husband had a pretty good-sized church, a couple of thousand, but she was an extreme introvert. I laid hands on her, began to prophesy. I said, the Lord says he's going to use you in conferences and these places, and I could see the fear get on her because she had never been to Bible school. She wasn't too super articulate, and I could see the fear coming on her as she heard the word speaker, conferences, crowds. And the Lord said, tell her this. And I had a vision. And in this vision, she was going to this big conference that she was going to be a speaker of, and she was going to the back door through security. When the security man saw her, he says, why are you here? She goes, I'm a speaker. He looked her up and down and said, you don't look like a speaker. Where are your credentials? She reached into her purse and pulled out a picture of her family. And she said, these are my credentials. If I could do it for my family, I can do it for God's family. Some of you have left the garden of your home. You've left the garden of your home. And a lot of you, you can't handle friction because you couldn't handle it at home. Your children are the first fruit of your anointing, your character. And if you don't have government at home, why would we want to put you on staff? God is saying, I'm going to breathe on you. And I'm going to put you in your garden. This is the prime directive. And we're going to play that Star 
backtrack thing again. They didn't know what to do with the prime director because they did not have a supreme leader to go to. And it was always an argument. But one of the things I like the most about this is that when they showed the names of the people on the mission, I'm sitting in pastors, I'm sitting in pastors basement and I saw this whole thing in a vision tonight. I saw the whole thing in a vision. And he said, put it on the screen. And I said, who are the people that are faithful? I, I did it. Pastor Dave didn't do it. I did it. I, I was going to put the people's names on there. I said, tell me the people that are faithful because I know the people because I'm here all the time and I see you working because you're in your position. I said, what happened to what's his name? Well, he's not here. He took off. I said, I said where's what's his name? Well, how come he, oh, he, I, he, didn't tell, he didn't let me know. He just took off. And that's why I put that last part. Missing in action. You know who you are. And I want to put it on there. I said, you know who you are. This is the divine pattern. Breathe on you and put you in your garden. His purpose has a presence. And his presence has a purpose. And we're going to receive an offering because God's going to move supernaturally in the next few moments. And some of you, your repentance is not complete till you go back to the people you abandoned, the job you abandoned, the people you irritated, the people you weren't faithful to. That's when God says, you're back in my purpose. And there are people that used to be in this church, and God's calling you back. Don't just sneak in the back door. Go directly to the pastor, the people you hurt, and say, hey, dude, I'm sorry. Why? Because we don't want you sneaking around here. We want you back in your position. Repentance is not complete to those restitution. You know why? God wants you to be back in your purpose. And if you always feel somebody has got an issue with you, you'll never get back in your purpose. That's why he said, go make restitution. Go make restitution. Now, I want the usher to give everybody an envelope. Everybody. Even give the two-year-old baby envelope. Give, give them an envelope. Maybe daddy will put some money in there for the baby. Go ahead and play some. Now, Father, we thank you right now that you're calling us back to purpose and the prime directive, the prime directive. Where's Gary D at? Where's Gary D at? Make out your tick to the rock. And we need some big givers today because we're a little bit below budget. The pastor is, the church is. Do something special today. And what's going to happen is that God is going to give you dreams and visions. He's done the breathing part. Now he's going to do the put you in the garden part. He's done the breathing part, but he's going to put you in your garden to guard it and to nurture it and cultivate it. If you want to give by credit card, you can do it on that envelope. This is the last offering for the conference. Do something sacrificial today. Man, I just feel the authority of God in this place. And now to the King eternal, immortal. How many enjoyed the music that Trevor began to sing? How many saw something get on Trevor tonight? How, how many could physically see something got on him that was different? How many heard the growl and the aggression? That's because he's in his purpose. Where is your garden and are you faithful in it? Where is your garden? He breathes on you, then he put man in the garden. He breathed on Adam, then he put him in the garden to tend it and cultivate it. That means it started with nothing. He had to cultivate it. If you're making out a check, make it out to the rock. Now, as he sings this song, man, I'm just so full today. I just... Do you understand? I've known this pastor almost 20 years. I love him like a brother. I'm closer to him than I am to my own brother. And I take it very personally when people are not faithful to the thing that he's been called to. I take it personal, just like any brother would. So if you feel like I'm on the edge, it's because I am on the edge. Because this, to me, is not an assignment. 
that I did for money is an assignment for love. I remember when Pastor Dave had his trucking company. He missed God and got that trucking company. And he was so depressed and money wasn't coming in and he just did that to make money come in. And I said, hey, dude, just come. I paid his ticket. I said, come off the road. And he was with me for two weeks. Remember that, Dave? I said, man, you need to be around me. Just come and be with me. I hear the Spirit of God saying, get back in your garden. Get back in your garden. Get back in your garden. The Lord, the King, wants you in your garden. You could have not heard what you heard here if these people hadn't been in their garden. Nicole on the keyboard, the drummer, the bass player. It wouldn't be possible. The sound men wouldn't be possible. Wouldn't have been possible. The Lord spoke to me years ago about people that would not be faithful in areas where they weren't seen. And he said, the reason you're not faithful in the little thing is because of how you see yourself with God. But when you see yourself with God as a father and a son, no matter where he puts you, you're excited about it because you're bringing forth the kingdom. All right, you can receive their offerings. Pastor Dave, I want you to stand right here. I want you to stand right here. I want you to lower the lights that if you need to make restitution and repent to your pastor because you've been out of your garden, the one that you said God told you, the one that you said God told me to do this, you said it. If you have been unfaithful to your guard, you've missed the prime directive. You've missed your prime directive. As they sing, I want you to come and make it right today. He said, well, Kevin, you're confrontational. Absolutely. You show me a prophet that's not confrontational. I'll show you Pastor Peter Pan taking God's people to never, never land. Things don't happen unless somebody makes it happen. Authority is not authority until you use it. Make sure we got the words on the screen, guys. Come on, sing it. Are you faithful in your garden? drum up here. I need a drum up here. Come on. You've been unfaithful in your garden that you said God put you there. If you know you've been unfaithful to the garden that God put you in, get out of your seat. If you have been unfaithful to the garden that God put you in, get out of your seat. Because God wants to bring the presence back on you again. His presence has a purpose. His presence has a purpose. His presence has a purpose. Come on, drummer, come on. Come on, Clay, be authoritative. Come on. Come on, Clay, become authoritative.
if you have been unfaithful in your garden, get out of your seat and repent to the pastor now. First he breathes on you, then he puts you in a garden. Come on, come on, come on. That's what happens in your garden. That's what will happen in your garden. Come on, you have been unfaithful in the garden that you said God put you. His purpose has a presence. His purpose has a presence. Come on, you know who you are if you're here tonight. You've been unfaithful in your garden. You have been unfaithful in your garden. God is breathing on you again. You know who you are. Even the young people, even the young people. Now, I'm going to open up to the next thing. God has been telling you to get involved, but you resist his voice. God's been telling you to get involved, but you've been resisting his voice. If that is you, get out of your seat and tell the pastor, I've been resisting God's voice to serve in the garden. Now, I'm not talking about working for the church. I'm talking about working for the king. And if you've been hiding, not abiding, as you sing this again, get out of your seat and say, I want to make a fresh commitment. This is the pattern. God breathes on you, and then he puts you in the garden to guard it and to nurture it. Go ahead. If you have not obeyed God's voice, the thing that God told you to do, get in line right now. Get in line. Get in line right now. You couldn't be faithful because you never started. You could not be faithful because you never started. Get out of your feet right now. Raise his microphone up if you could. Your love's like rain on this Come on, if it's not practical, it's not spiritual. In the cool this is a very practical way to administrate the move of God. It's a very practical way to administrate the move of God. Come on, raise it up. Come on, he's about to walk in your garden. He's coming. You were never faithful. You never started. You never started. Come on, Clay. Come on, Bishop. Come on, Bishop. You never started. Come on, it's time to repent. Get it right. His presence needs a purpose. His presence needs a purpose. 
Stop running from the garden. 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 Come on, warfare. Make it a warfare song. You haven't been faithful. Come on, come back to the garden. 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 I need some people to come and hug Jay. Welcome back to the garden. Welcome back to the garden. Welcome back to the garden. All it takes is just one word. My daily bread. Just one word. What gets you back in your garden? Raise Benny's microphone up. Raise his microphone. Just one word. Just one word. My daily bread. My daily bread. Just one word. Just one word. Spoken to my God. I need just one word. Just one word. On just one word. Oh, just one word. Just one word. Just one word. Puts me back in my garden. I hear the sound of the wall. Coming to my God. Coming to my God. Worship God. Come on and praise Him for restoration. Come on and praise Him for restoration. Being restored to our right places in the garden of God.
restoring us in the garden in the garden come on we're going to get on the mission get ready we're going to do that song again we've got enough guys to do it okay today God is saying I'm coming to visit the deep things inside of you We're going to play that as, as he begins to sing that song again. Deep calls in the deep. And I know that we have people that have to leave, but you know what? God's going to bring the presence on this thing because God is calling to your deep thing. And we're going to begin to play that Star Trek thing again. You need to get your name on there. You need to get your name on there. You need to be one of the people that gets on that name. Go ahead. We have all of our singers and everybody. You ready? Go ahead and start. And be aggressive as you sing it. All right, you can put the words for the song up there now. When the deep calls out to deep Enlarge my heart to receive. And when your presence pours over me, I will not run, no, I won't retreat. For your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me, your deep cries out. You deep cries out, you deep cries out to the deep in me. You deep cries out, you deep cries out, you deep cries out to the deep in me. You deep cries out, you deep cries out. Lord, I hunger, Lord, I thirst for my soul. To me.
Cause your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out, yeah. Oh, your deep cries out, your deep cries out, your deep cries out to the deep in me. Your deep cries out, your deep cries out.
fight his war. I am not a superstar, just in order to fight his war. See, I am not a superstar, just in order to fight his war. I am not a superstar, just in order, just in order. See, I am not a superstar, just in order to fight his war.
How many ready for the Lord to put you in your garden tonight? Come on, just say, Lord, put me in my garden. I will guard it. I will nurture it. I will cultivate it. One of the things that's going to happen in the next 30 days is that God's going to give dreams and visions and prophetic words about the garden. If it is not practical, it is really not spiritual. Whenever God moves, there's always a next. And he breathed on Adam and put him in the garden. We don't want you to come on your own accord. We want God to put you in the garden you belong to in this place. I want you to raise your hands and say, I give up my right to say no. Pick me up and put me in the garden that you desire for me. Put me in the garden that you made me for. And Lord, hold me accountable for the garden choices that I say yes to. Come on, play something. Come on, sanctify the Lord in your heart right now. Sanctify the Lord as almighty God in your heart right now. Put him in the highest place in your heart. Angels are moving in the atmosphere right now. Angels are moving in the atmosphere right now. Come on, the prime directive is moving upon your life right now. When you say yes, the prime directive begins to move on your life. Somebody say, I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. I say yes. The prime directive is moving towards you. His presence has a purpose. Trevor Wyatt. I got a word for you. Today, I saw you. Tonight, we saw you. You're one of the most gifted singers, songwriters, musicians I know. But tonight I saw you. I didn't see Bethel. I didn't see Jesus culture. I didn't see United. Because you're all that and more. And I see God is calling you out into your individuality and in music. Because you're the rock. And they need to be imitating you. They need to, tonight I saw the veins popping in your neck. That's passion. I'm going to be looking for those veins now. How many of y'all would agree with me that we saw him this weekend? And I know musicians, musicians are like preachers. We want to be relevant. We want to be, you know, speaking what. God is speaking today, but I use a lot of his material 
but I am not Kevin. You know, you, use, you guys use a lot of other groups' materials, but you're not them. But there comes a point in time where there's an individuality, like Clay is coming into an individuality with his records. You know, when you hear him, you hear Clay Webb, you know. But I just saw you this week step out into you, and that's who we want. You know, we want you. And if you will be free in you, there will be imitating you. Your songs will be going out, and they'll be saying, they'll be playing your songs. Not just, and not that we don't share songs. We're always going to share songs. That's awesome. Because one person can't write them all. Just like we share insights, we share revelations. I mean, this week has been one of the most... With, with Apostle Benny and, and Kevin and all the gifts, Brian and Karen and Dean, I've just seen one of the most incredible weeks of fivefold ministry I've ever seen. Would you agree, pastors? It's just been incredible to see the gifts work together, hasn't it? You don't see this very often, do you? You go to conferences and you don't see this very often where I got a part. I got a part. It's usually, you know... <clears throat> Stay out of the way. This is my time. This is my turn. But, you know, what we've seen this week transpire, I think, is one of the most incredible pictures of the body of Christ. Every part does its share. Every joint supplies. And what happens to the body? It grows. And I don't know about you, but I've grown this week. How about you? Have you grown this week? Huh? Come on. I mean, I'm growing. I'm full. I've hit the I've hit the glory fried point, right? If I hit it this morning, actually, I mean, I hit the wall this morning. I'm like, I'm glory fried. <laughs> you know, I I said next conference we're going to do Monday and Tuesday morning, and that's it. We'll just do evenings. I because about about five services straight, and you're just like you hit a saturation point where you just got to process some and, and rest some and and put things together. But man, what an incredible, incredible, incredible week. And um, Kevin, we were driving down the street there, and he goes, you ever do a fall conference? And I said, no, we do a winter and a summer. And when he said it, I never thought about it. And then tonight when we were in here, this fall, we're, we're and it actually begins now, but this fall, there's going to be a shift in the, in the house here. I just feel that. I feel there's going to be a shift this fall. We're going to be doing some more intensive type training. We're starting a school of preaching. And we're, we're really going to ramp it up. And I really feel like, you know, when we had that thing the other night where, I don't know, 150 of you or so come up here on the stage and said, I want to be an extreme disciple. And I'm enlisting in the extreme discipleship program. I hope you took that serious because I did. You know. And you need to submit your name to that, to the office. You need to submit your name and say, count me in on that. Because if there's an extreme disciple meeting called, we want to be able to get a hold of you to say, hey, we're having a meeting tonight. Well, it's Monday. We don't have church on Monday. We do tonight. Because there's an extreme disciple night, you know. So, and um, we're going to be bringing Kevin in to help launch some things. And so we'll probably get something on the books for, you know, maybe mid-September or something when, when we get things ramped back in and we won't do day services because school will be going on but I want to bring him back in and get him into the wove into the fabric of what we're going to do this fall because uh, you know somebody came up to me the other day and I've been talking to Dave Cuppet for three years you know about one day we we're going to have a Bible college here of a, of a not not a traditional but a, a school where we train preachers and teachers and we take saints to maturity. And I've always known Cuppet was supposed to be a part of that. And somebody walked up to me the other day and said, you know, I think Cuppet coming back is a, a timing thing. And I, I told him when he left, you know, don't get too comfortable because you'll be back. And uh, so I think there's some things that are going to be set in motion. Amen. But uh, so I just want you to know it ain't over tonight. It's just 
refresh. You know, it's just a refreshing and just a fresh step forward to say, okay, we've got some wind in our sails now. Let's get back. Let's, let's hit this thing. Let's hit the ground running, and let's see what God says, and then what? 2014 REAP conference was over, and then what? Turn around and say, and then what? Amen. What are you going to do with your new thing? <laughs> what are you going to do with your new thing? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What are we going to do with a brand new Trevor Wyatt? Take him for a test drive. Saturday night, we'll take him for a test drive. Amen. <laughs> oh, you're going to be stretched out. I've done announced you publicly. You ain't got a choice but to show up. Amen. <laughs> Trevor told me, he said, you know I work best under pressure. I said, I know. So, uh, Hallelujah. Because you wrote another song for this that we haven't introduced yet, right? Yeah. Saturday night, be a good night to fire that one up. Amen. Hallelujah. But you guys are gifted songwriters, and some of the songs that have been birthed out of this house with Trevor and Cleta, Nicole, have written some incredible songs. Larry has written songs in years gone by, and uh, those, those, those songs are powerful. Something about musicians, sometimes they, they, especially Nicole and Trevor, they write a song and then they don't want to sing it. But I'm telling you, your stuff's as good as anybody out there. Or if not better. Amen. You and Nikki both. You and Nikki both. And uh, when you write songs, don't you, don't you put them in the file. Amen. You put them in the Dropbox on the active list. And you sing them because we want you. We love all these other guys, but we want, we want you. Only you can be Trevor Wyatt. Only you can prevent. I'll think of something. <laughs> Amen. I just want to thank Kevin and Apostle Benny, where you at? He's around here somewhere. I'm looking for orange. He's usually not hard to find. Oh, he's out there. Oh, well, I guess leave the meeting early too and go eat. Oh, snap. But uh, we thank God for all the gifts that have been here. Good to meet these two wonderful pastors that have been with us this week. Amen. Pastor Asaph and Enrique, I bless you guys. Safe travels, safe journeys back to Colorado. Amen. And for all of our other guests and home folk, it's been a great, great conference. Amen. Great, great conference. And we thank God for everything. And we're going to move forward now. What are you going to do with your new thing? Hallelujah. Amen. We love you. We bless you. We'll see you Saturday night, if not before. For the truly adventurous in faith, we'll be up in Columbus tomorrow night with Kevin doing the last service up there.